welcome to the first Evolution Live. I'm laughing because I just spent five minutes giving the intro and talking to the camera before realising that I have to press live twice and not just once. Hello for the second time and welcome to the stream. Sorry it's a bit late, there's technical issues on my end, on YouTube's end. We're going to get through it together, um, even though we can't be physically together. Um, we're going to do what we can, um, because we're not going to mention the C word. We're not going to mention that at all. But um, I am stuck at home on my own, hence why I'm trying to control every job. I am controlling the screen, the audio, the comments. I've got interactive stuff later on. Oh, it's going to be a hoot. Um, Welcome to the first of the Evolution Live lessons. This is going to be an online live streaming course where I teach you about my favourite topic, which is evolution. Um, I, if, you, if you're new to the channel, hi. Uh, usually, it, I would say usually it goes a bit better than that, but I don't usually live stream. Um, unusual times we live in. Um, so, uh, just if I look over here, I'm checking the comments. Um, so, I am going to have this course on evolution starting from what I would say is like a university, uh, sorry, starting from a GCSE sort of level. So, for those outside the UK, that's age 15, 16. And then if you are um, watching week on week, it will build up. And so, we'll start off easy and then it will progressively go through A level go kind of up to university level. Um, but the good thing is, is that at least in the UK, everyone's off from school. Um, unless you're the child of a key worker, you're not going to school and everyone doesn't have exams at the end of this year, which kind of sucks for you as a student, but it's great for me because it means I don't have to follow the syllabus that much because I don't know if you've seen the school syllabuses. Um, but they're really not tailored to people that want to be anything other than a medic, really. It's a lot of anatomy, it's a lot of dissection, there is no behavioural ecology whatsoever, and there is next to no evolution. So this is, even if you're not in school, this is a great chance just to have fun. If you don't want to learn about evolution, just stick me on in the background so that you feel a little bit more social in these um, less than social times. Um, have I got a class for you? Let me transition over here. I've got transitions and everything, it's so snazzy. Um, <laughs> so, um, okay, we've got, um, uh, first, I'm just trying to check the background. Please introduce the happy plants. Are these real plants? These are all real plants. Um, We've got a Calathea, a Ro uh, Clusia, we've got two Monstera, we've got, um, say, oh, what's this one? It's called the Praying Plant, because it goes up and down in the middle of the daytime. And that one is, an, I can't remember the name of it, but I do know that it's toxic to dogs. Um, I have so, like, these are only the big plants, so you'll get to know them as the weeks go on. Um, I, if you're new to the channel, that's what I was going to say. I am Dr. Sally LePage. I have a PhD in evolutionary biology, which is why I feel like I can give you this class. And I have no teach, official teaching qualifications, though, I should say. I have taught at university. I've given tutorials in um, statistics, maths, and um, obviously evolution. Um, but I am a full-time science communicator, so fingers crossed this should be a fun course um, as you can see this is the lesson structure here on the right um, this week is going to be kind of just a you know um, an introductory hour or so um, going to cover briefly what we mean by the term evolution and how we got to where we are now um, and then, like I say, it's going to build week on week. So let's get cracking. Um, and I'm going to start with, there we go. 
evolution means change. So when we think about the word evolution, um, there's both the lay word and the technical word. Um, you might say, oh, the evolution of iPhones has become much, much smaller and then much, much bigger over time. Or the evolution of language has changed since Shakespeare's day. Or that idea, that concept has evolved since when we first thought of it. And so in a general sense, evolution just means change over time. And that's how a lot of people will use it. There is also the biological sense, obviously, and as a biologist, I mostly refer to the biolo biological meaning of the word evolution. Um, and to me, evolution is the change in gene frequencies in a population over time. But we will break that down. Don't worry if there are lots of words in there that you don't understand. Um, in fact, I can... <laughs> This is going to be the first time that I do this, so this is very exciting for me. But let's switch over to the notebook. Ah! Through the, if this works, I'm going to be so happy. Through the magic of technology, I should be able to, as if this was like a whiteboard or something, I can write in the notebook. Um, so I come over here and I can say that number one, oh no, let me select a pen first. Um, I can say number one, evolution equals, you're going to have to forgive my handwriting because obviously I am using a tablet here and it's all a bit weird, but evolution is change. Um, in a biological sense, we're talking about the change, like what is changing in the biological sense. So for biology, it's the change in allele frequency in a population. Over time. Um, now there's probably some words that you don't recognize in there. So, okay, I think we understand the word change, but we got what's allele, yeah? Um, We've got uh, frequency, you probably know as um, something happens frequently or less frequently, but there's also a, um, a way that we measure frequency in terms of biology. And then we've got, importantly, in a population. So what we're talking about is not happening in an individual. Um, it's happening at a population level. Um, someone's just commented, um, this is quite basic, that's because this is the first in the course and it will get progressively harder and the later classes will build on the earlier classes. So this is for people with no background this lesson. Um, so I don't want to go too deep into exactly what we mean by this, but allele is a special word for a gene. Um, and so genes, um, G-E-N-E, not J-E-A-N-S, um, genes are the, um, I suppose they are the recipe book for making a person or making any living thing. So I have my own genes that say, okay, you need to have pale skin, brown eyes, freckles. Um, I would like to have a nose in the center of the face. I would like to have straight hair. Um, and it's the genes that control all of that. Um, but each gene can have different options, like different flavours, like maybe you've got a cake recipe, but you can change out uh, chocolate for vanilla or strawberry. And so one gene, the gene that codes for the flavour of the cake, might come in lots of different flavours. And those are called alleles, so different types. And um, that is... Um, if I like, it, it's just the comments. I have so many things to monitor at once right now. Um, and so, where was I going? This is, this is going wonderfully. There should definitely be two people doing this job. Um, and so we're looking at how the proportion of the genes changes over time. Now, 
if you, I was having a look at the AQA GCSE syllabus just because I wanted to know what you should be learning in schools. Um, and they define, so A level defines it like I do, it's the change in allele frequencies in a population. GCSE defines it as a change in the inherited characteristics of a population over time, great, through a process of natural selection which may result in the formation of new species. Um, which is an interesting point. Um, I'm going to go to back to here and say that, so we know that evolution means change. And the next point is that natural selection is not the same as evolution. We often use the two words interchangeably. I have them brandishing my digital stylus at you. Um, but um, evolution and natural selection are not the same thing. And um, here is why. So if you think about evolution is just the change in genes, part of that change is due to natural selection. And we'll talk a little, little bit more later about what we mean by natural selection, because that's like the majority of what we study when we're studying evolution. That's the cool bit. That's the bit that Darwin came up with. That's the survival of the fittest, even though we'll talk about why that's not necessarily such a good way of describing it. Um, but there's also this other part which people forget. Um, and so going back to the notebook, um, we can say that, um, so if you imagine evolution as an equation, we've got evolution as a whole, which is, remember, just changes in genes. There's no inner adaptation sense. It's literally just any change in genes can be described as evolution. Um, so because of that, evolution has you've got the random part. Um, actually, let's start with natural selection. Natural selection is non-random part. And then we've got a random part. And so this is what we would describe as natural selection. And this includes things like genetic drift. Um, so, the concept of random is really important to biology and evolution in particular. Um, and we're gonna talk about a lot about that in the next class, which is going to be all about mutations and how we generate random stuff. Um, but you can think of evolution as there is random variation. Any mutation can happen, give or take. And the non-random part is who dies. <laughs> I'm sorry to put it bluntly, but there's a lot of death in evolution and there's a lot of reproduction in evolution as well. This will stay totally PG, um, this course, but you've got to know that there's a lot of reproduction and there is a lot of death involved. Death is kind of like the driver of evolution. So you have lots of things being born and then non-randomly some of them die. There's a non-random reason why some of them die other than others. And so that is the... Um, non-random aspect here. So there's a reason why some of the genes do better than others. Then we've got the random part which often gets forgotten. But that is anything that causes a change in the genetics over time that isn't to do with natural selection. And like I say, we'll cover drift a little bit more, but it could just be that, you know, there happens to be a mutation, but it doesn't affect anything. And so it just silently just sneaks past anything to do with selection and death. And unless you actually 
read the code unless you got your big lab machinery and read all the different letters of the genetic code you wouldn't even know that that change had happened and so that's an example of what might happen there um, um, the next point we have is uh, no going back to this um, number three and I'm thinking I might make this um, notepad available on Patreon afterwards and um, if that's something you'd be interested in. obviously you can just scroll backwards and forwards this video will be available on my YouTube channel after it's gone live so you can play it back at any time um, and you can obviously take notes but if you want just this particular example I'll probably stick that up on Patreon afterwards um, so this is the big one I hope you're paying attention here because in fact I'm going to write it in big red letters um, evolution does not that means does not equal does not equal progress this is one of the biggest misconceptions when it comes to um, evolution and it can all be summarized by this picture here many of you will recognize this picture uh, picture which is the ascent of man firstly we're going to ignore the fact that it is entirely men and where are women in this picture but the big thing wrong with this more than anything else is that implicitly there is an arrow going through this picture it's saying that this I'd say it looks like a chimpanzee goes into this which looks like an early human maybe like Lucy um, one of the um, early homo species and then we get to this which is one of the even uh, slightly later species so we've got tool use now um, and then we go forward again and we're starting to get close to modern humans that's probably Neanderthals who were really quite sophisticated they had culture they probably had language and um, they have amazing like you can see beadwork that was created by Neanderthals and um, cave paintings as well like they were a sophisticated species and then finally here we get to um, Homo sapiens but this is not how evolution works <laughs> that's not how it happens um, I mean later on we can talk about how actually it should be branching so these are all separate branching but it implies that evolution has a direction to it that this is the kind of where's my pen gone that this is the the best this is 10 out of 10 and this is one out of ten and everything is getting increasingly better that's not how evolution works you gotta remember that evolution does not have foresight although it operates over a very long period of time it can only work on what's happening in the present day it can only um, and obviously evolution is like I say it's just a process there is no I want this gene to be pushed forward it's it's not an active way of thinking and this is one of the hardest things to get your head around when you're studying evolution is that it creates things it seems to create things that look designed it seems to create things that are well adapted for the environment but that's just resulting from a spontaneous process there's no driving force behind it. So if ever I say that this animal wants to survive for longer or wants to be able to escape from prey and predators, uh, sorry, escape from predators, um, they don't necessarily want to. We call it the teleological argument. We give this sense of purpose, but it's really, really important to remember that there is no sense of purpose in evolution. Um, I can't stress that enough um, and so that this live stream doesn't go on for too long I will stop stressing that point but I'm sure I'll come back to it later on 
Um, and so the next part is not that one. <laughs> Ignore that. Um, here we go. The world is not static. Now we're starting to talk about what used to be um, the case. So let me just prepare the noteboard. And if you do have questions, um, do let me know in the chat. I am keeping half an eye about on um, on things that are going on there whilst also trying to keep it. Oh wow, there is really a big delay. There's maybe a 30, 60 second delay there. Um, so, let's just move that up a bit. Actually, I don't need that just yet. This is what I could really do with a second person helping me out on the technical side of things. Um, the world is not static. This is going to be a brief history of the ideas of evolution. And I'll say now that it's a very Western focused history. People were having ideas about species, about animals, about evolution throughout the world. Of course they did. Um, but the most influential, for whatever reasons, um, the most influential evolutionary biologists came from the, the West and Europe. And so that's why I am going to delve into it um, from a European perspective. But in, in the olden days, um, once upon a time, let me tell you a story. Uh, once upon a time, people believed that the earth was fixed. They believed that a god, um, because this is Europe, they believed that the Christian god created the world as it is now and that there has been very little change over the years that um, all the animals that we see now have always existed they thought that all the plants have existed that all the continents have always existed in the way that they have done and for a, for some reason not uh, for and that's partly because they thought that the world was new it's crazy to think that the, the actual land that you're standing on didn't exist if you think that the earth is only 10,000 years old, when it's a lot easier to think that the land and the continents have shifted if you realise that the earth is 4.5 billion years old. So, you know, they hadn't worked out how long time was. Um, but then starting in the late... 1700s and the early 1800s, lots of ideas started to happen at the same time. And it's one of those cases where everyone was having very similar ideas independently. And so it was like this, it was just bound to happen that evolution was gonna become discovered or the, um, the idea would come about during this time. And so going back to the notebook, um, we have this guy. This is, um, sorry, let me check that there. Yeah, this is Charles Lyle. Sorry, Charles, I just cropped you off here. Um, and he was, you'll notice there are an awful lot of white dudes um, in this history, unfortunately. Um, I just spell Lyle. Um, and we're talking about the 1830s here. So Charles Lyle um, was the guy behind plate tectonics. Um, he was an amazing geologist. Um, so he looked at rocks and looked at all the different layers of the rocks and realised kind of that you've got the, the newest um, levels of rocks at the top and the oldest levels of rocks are buried much, much deeper. And from looking at that and from looking at fossils, they were able to say, wow, the earth is actually really, really old. Um, 
And that may not seem important to the idea of evolution, but we'll get on to why it is. And you also realise that, wow, the, the plate tectonics, the, the massive lumps of rock that our continents sit on have been shifting over time. And sure, they've only been shifting very, very small amounts each year, like maybe, I don't know, a millimetre a year or so. But when you realise that the Earth is so old, suddenly that gives you the capacity to have a huge amount of change. Um, so his big thing was gradual forces operating over geological time. So the Earth maybe has operated in the same way it does now. So um, when a river flows into the sea, a very small amount of sediment gets dropped behind and leaves behind a very small amount of land at the estuary. And that's insignificant over a year. But then those same gradual forces over millions of years will create entire new countries and land masses. So that's Charles Lyell. We then get on to white dude number two. This is um, Thomas Malthus. And he was writing in the 1790s. Now, Malthus was an, um, I suppose, an economist, really. But before he was an economist, he was a demographer. He was interested in looking at human populations. And we say something is Malthusian nowadays if it refers to his works. Um, he came up with the concept of, or he um, described the struggle for existence. And so what Malthus saw, and remember he is living in kind of the pre-industrial West. Um, he's Scottish, I think. Um, certainly British, so he's living in Britain kind of before we have amazing medicine or anything like that. And he saw that there was a huge amount of overpopulation and that um, human populations was growing and growing and growing in an exponential way. We've heard a lot about exponential growth um, in recent times. But if um, your family has, I don't know, five kids that would have been common in his day, and then each of those kids has another five kids, and then each of those kids has another five kids, then the population curve will go um, slowly, so and then very rapidly increase. I should draw that in a different colour. Um, so the population grows slowly, 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 and then rapidly increases. Um, and he realised that there were improvements in farming techniques, which was great, but the improvements in farming techniques would only happen a, a linear way, so that you gradually, I don't know, this year we made 10 tonnes more than last year. And then the following year we made 10 tonnes more and 10 tonnes more. So it's improving, sure, but it's not growing in that rapid way. And so what you get is you get... Um, I'm going to colour it in rainbow because I can. Is you get this gap here, which is where you have um, population outstripping resources. And he realised that when you have a large number of people and a small amount of resources, there's going to be a struggle. <laughs> Basically, we celebrate this man for realising that if there's not enough food around, people will starve, um, to put it very shortly. Um, and so that was the idea of Malthus. And so all of this is kind of happening 19, uh, sorry, uh, late 1700s, early 1900s. Um, just going to zoom out and bring my next few pictures down. Um, and then you got to remember that although we think that um, selection and natural selection was a new idea, farmers have been breeding for millennia. If you've seen what like an old 
fashion, like a really, really old wheat variety. Like what did wheat used to look like before modern farming? It was really tall, it was really straggly, and the seeds were tiny and hard. Um, there's a seed called tearsinte, which you might have heard of. I probably should have found a picture for you. Um, but tearsinte kind of looks like this. And it's all straggly. And these are really, really tough seeds. They take an awful lot of preparing to get the nutritious bit out the middle. And you can see you really don't get many seeds per plant, per stalk. But through lots of breeding nowadays, we have turned Tiacinte into corn on the cob or maize or sweet corn or however you want to call it. And so you can see that over time, what does sweet corn look like? It's got these big leaves like that, hasn't it? That's not a bad picture of sweet corn if I do say so myself. Um, and so over time, farmers have been changing what animals and plants look like. Um, and so that concept was still going around and there was this idea slowly going around that maybe species aren't fixed. Um, maybe all animals were not created in a single week by a single entity and have remained that way ever since. We've also at that time got um, Mary Anning and the idea of fossils and these animals that used to live but now don't live, um, which was some big ideas. And then moving to a bit more biological stuff, we have this guy. This is um, I'd ask in the chat, but let's be honest, the delay is huge. Jean Baptiste Lamarck. Um, I don't think it's the same Lamarck as in Les Mis, where they're like, Lamarck is dead. Lamarck, his death is the sign we await the people's man. I don't think it's that Lamarck. I think it's a very different Lamarck. But he was, um, when was he? He was in the 1800s. And he has these ideas about all of these species changing. Um, and I mean, to be fair to him, it wasn't a bad, it wasn't that bad of an idea that he came up with. Um, we call it transmutation. My voice is already getting sore because I haven't spoken to anyone in about two weeks. Um, so transmutation was the big thing about Lamarck and we call his idea Lamarckism. Um, and it is the idea that something that happens, that basically the, the fancy way of describing it is acquired characteristics get inherited. So let's imagine that you have, what animal can I draw here? Um, let's imagine that you have a dog. <laughs> oh God, it looks nothing like a dog already. Oh well, let's say you have some random four-legged mammal. Mm. I don't know what animal that is. Oh dear, um, this is some unknown animal, <laughs> it could be anything. Um, in fact, let's make it some unknown animal. This is the classic example. Um, and let's say it eats leaves. And so there's some, some leaves on a, on a branch just up here. And I don't know if you ever read the Rudyard Kipling Just So stories. Um, my dad actually used to make up just so stories for me as a kid, but it would be like how the leopard got its spots or how the, um, what was my favourite, how the rhino got its wrinkly skin. 
Um, and it was that, so the, how the rhino got its wrinkly skin is that, I don't know if this is the real version or just my dad's version, that um, the rhino was eating cake and it scoffed all of the cake. Oh, it, it was a hot day and the rhino used to have really tight skin. So it took off its skin to have a bath and then it ate some cake, but then it got some crumbs stuck inside the skin and it put the skin back on and it was so itchy that it rubbed itself up against a tree and um, th that rubbing actually stretched the skin and created the folds. Um, I am going to see if this works. Ah, oh, yes, it does. Amazing. Um, so maybe this little random animal stretched out a little bit in order to, um, to reach some of the tasty leaves. And in fact, it stretched its neck out so much that um, it, its neck grew a little bit longer. You know, like if you work out a lot, then your muscles get bigger. Maybe this random mammal um, stretched out his neck so much that it actually got a longer neck. And then what Lamarck said, oh, oh God, I've dismembered it. Um, what Lamarck said was that the offspring of this animal um, would then have longer necks so the next generation would start off with like neck plus a little bit like level two neck and um and that meant that it could reach um there we go it could reach the bits that were even slightly further away um, and it grew its neck to level three. And then it's had its offspring and its offspring had level three necks. Um, I'd like to remind you, this is an incorrect theory. Don't be thinking this is how evolution works. This is what Lamarck thought and shaped our way of thinking for a while. Um, and then its offspring finally got even longer necks. And then it also happened to get spots. Don't ask me how. And hey presto, you now have a giraffe. Um, <laughs> this is not how evolution works, okay? Um, so there are some key ideas in Lamarckism, which are that, um, so an individual, individual acquires, acquires, um, say a good, characteristic we call these characteristics traits so like um like a long neck and then that new trait um is inherited by and large Anything that happens, in an, so an individual can change over time, like we say evolution can just mean change over time. An individual can get big muscly arms, or if I dye my hair blonde, my hair now looks different. If I scratch myself and get a big scar across my face, if I do a tattoo, like there are many ways in which an individual can change over time. But that new trait does not get inherited. If you see those people that are covered head to toe in tattoos, their kids are not born with tattoos. If you see someone that's been punched up in a huge fight and they have loads of scars and maybe they've got a cauliflower ear and a broken nose, their kids are not born with all of those blemishes. Um, and with the exception of epigenetics, which we'll cover a tiny bit, this is not how evolution works. And so Lamarck was good. He was thinking about how some things make an animal better at surviving. So having a longer neck makes that giraffe better at surviving. And the idea that it's passed down through families. Um, but he didn't think, well, you know, I could, I don't know, paint my dog blue and that dog's puppies will not be blue. So that's Lamarckism, and Lamarckism is not correct. In fact, just 
not correct. But in every biology course, you're expected to know about Lamarckism. Even though it's incorrect, I suppose you're less likely to make that mistake if you understand it. Just gonna, sun is slowly going in. Um, so let me just adjust the camera and take a quick look at the comments. Um, this video will remain on um, afterwards on YouTube afterwards. Um, okay, so um, oh, that's Jean Baptiste. Now we've got the one, the only. Darwin. But you may be thinking, Sally, that looks nothing like Darwin. And that's because it's not Charles Darwin. This is Erasmus Darwin. And this is um, Charlie Boy's granddad. Now, uh, Erasmus Darwin, what a dude. I could spend hours talking about Erasmus Darwin. I won't. Um, we've already been on for an hour. Um, and he was such a cool guy. So remember, he is um, in kind of, again, the early 1800s. Um, oops. I meant to do that. Um, so Erasmus Darwin is happening in the 1800s and he is so progressive. He, I can't even remember what year Victoria came to the throne. She died in 1901 and she was around for about, what, 60, 70 years? So he's before Victorian times. And yet, <laughs> he um, is a, he's a real Renaissance man. He is a poet. He is a scientist. He is um, political. He had two illegitimate daughters and he campaigned for rights for women and managed to get them to open up, I think, a school. And that was something that just women did not have um, like ownership of anything in those days. Um, his poetry was really saucy and sexy to the point where I can't actually describe half of it. Um, but he was a cool dude. And just to kind of reinforce the idea that these ideas of changes in species over time were just bubbling up all over the place. Um, he wrote a poem, he wrote many poems. Um, and I'm going to read you his poem. I don't actually know if I can copy and paste. Is this gonna work? Oh, it is, oh, amazing. Um, so he wrote this poem, which is, um, organic life beneath the shoreless waves was born and nursed in ocean's pearly caves. First forms minute, unseen by spheric glass, move on the mud or pierce the watery mass. These, as successive generations bloom, new powers acquire and larger limbs assume, whence countless groups of vegetation spring and breathing realms of fin and feet and wing. Like, you don't think you were getting song and poetry in this. Um, but he wrote this in 1803. Um, and as you can see, it actually in poetic form covers a lot of um, ideas of evolution. So it starts in the seas and then it starts off tiny and invisible. Um, you can't see it with a microscope. Um, so it starts off as a primordial microbial soup. And then um, it slowly goes onto land and over lots of generations, um, it gets better and acquires new powers and characteristics. Um, and then over generations, it gets longer limbs um, until eventually it has fins and feet and wings. So there's a lot of like proper evolutionary natural selection ideas in there. And remember, this is Erasmus Darwin. This isn't Charlie Boy. This is Erasmus. But um, finally, we, well, not finally, 
Um, we do also move on to um, I'm going to have to move all of these down. We're moving on to these boys. Um, I hope you recognize this Darwin. And this is not quite so well known, but this is Alfred Russell Wallace. Um, and so we have... Oh, I don't know how many S's and how many L's there are in Russell. I think it's that. I may very briefly check. Um, that's not how you spell it. He only has one L. Um, so these two are the fathers of evolution, uh, by natural selection at least. Um, and so now we've gone from these kind of shifting ideas of, you know, species just are, oh, they never change, to, well, it's been an awful long time on this planet. Maybe there's been time for them to change really, really slowly, to maybe something grows and gets passed on to the next generation and then slowly builds up um, into this whole new species. And then we get these two who come up with the theory of natural selection. Um, and I'm putting arrows to both of them because although this guy is the most important and he did develop the theory much more thoroughly and he thought it through a lot more than Alfred Russell Wallace did, they both came up with it at the same time. So what is um, natural selection? Natural selection um, is the, uh, it's, it's basically the idea of survival of the fittest. Darwin didn't like the term and Darwin didn't come up with the term survival of the fittest. If I remember rightly, Huxley, Thomas Huxley, who um, was debating with the Archbishop Wilberforce in the famous debate where they debated on the origin of species, Darwin's number one bestseller, I'd say. Um, he wrote other books, but that was definitely, I think, the slightly more popular one on the origin of species. Um, and, um, but it was Huxley who came up with the idea of survival of the fittest. The idea is that um, an animal or a plant or literally any living thing ha is born for some reason by random chance with a, bet with a new characteristic. So if we'll go back to our giraffe example, for some reason, um, a giraffe would be born with a longer neck. It doesn't grow its neck longer during the course of its lifetime, but it's born that way. And baby, you were born that way, um, black, white, or beige. I, I was gonna put in a Lady Gaga reference there, but I realized it was at the end of the verse, so it didn't quite work. Um, and so, um, you got this idea that you are, um, so randomly, we're back to that word random again. So randomly, um, an individual is born, um, with a different trait. And that is born um, basically means that it's due to genetics. And remember at the very start I said that evolution was a change in gene frequencies over time. That's the gene bit. So randomly an individual is born with a different trait. 
um, let's say it's um, positive selection. So um, that trait makes it do better. And later on in the course, we'll go into what we mean by do better. But for now, we're talking about makes it survive for longer, makes it have more kids, those sorts of things. Um, I do apologise about the handwriting. Um, and then, um, so a big part is have more kids. And then the offspring, those kids, inherit this new trait until, um, so in the next generation, um, there are more individuals with this trait. So let's put it a really, really simple idea. Um, Let's say that you are a B. No, that's a really bad example, Sally. That's a really, really bad example to choose. Let's say that you are a bird and you eat worms and um, you need five worms to produce every egg. Um, but in your lifetime, you can only collect 20 worms. And so you can only produce a maximum of four eggs. But then randomly, by complete chance, one bird is special. Um, it's like that, um, in a world where worms are a limiting resource, one bird was born with a bigger beak. Um, one bird. I, that's one of the things I'm very annoyed about having a female voice is that I can't do them. One bird takes on the odds. Um, one bird is born with a bigger beak and so now that bird can eat 25 worms over the course of its lifetime. And so that bird can have five eggs, five offspring, five kids, um, compared to all the other birds, which only have four. So in the next generation, and if we assume that all of the, those eggs from that bird with the big beak have big beaks themselves, in the next generation, all else being equal, there'll be five birds in the population with big beaks. And then, those five birds will do better and will again have five. And so it will gradually take up a bigger and a bigger. If you look at the population as a whole, the fraction of that population um, with big beaks will grow and will grow and will grow until eventually maybe everyone has big beaks. Um, and we'll, we'll call that an adaptation. Um, but that's kind of the ideas. Obviously, I'm not going into it too much. This is the history part of the course. So we know the background. Um, and so those are the ideas of, of Darwin and Wallace. And so Darwin famously was looking at finches. Um, she's got her pens out again. We know this is going to be a good drawing. Um, so Darwin was on a big gap year. And he decided, oh, that's really bad, to travel to the Galapagos. Um, and we think now 
that actually he came up with the idea of natural selection before he realised that the finches he'd collected on the Galapagos had different shaped beaks. So the order might be a little bit the other way around, but it's still a very good example. Um, he saw that some birds had very thin beaks and so were very good at like, I don't know, picking out seeds from between cactus spines. And some had very big beaks that if you imagine like a big um, vice or pliers, they're big and heavy duty so they can crush things a lot better. Um, and so um, they've got more crushing power, they can have more seeds and that means that um, they do better in environments with big hard seeds whereas the ones with tiny little beaks are good at picking up tiny little seeds um, and so he's and then he did so much like here's a confession okay youtuber confession time i a doctor of evolutionary biology have not finished reading darwin's on the origin of species by natural selection because he spends the first three chapters talking about pigeons. <laughs> and I have read those first three chapters so many times and just get so bored that I can't actually carry on. Like, I've dipped into it. I know where the important bits are. I've not, I haven't read it from cover to cover, is what I mean. Um, because, oh my God, he spent so long talking about pigeons. Because like we were talking earlier, farmers knew about how to change the characteristics of an animal or a plant over time. And in his day, um, pigeons were like the big thing. So like now we've got pugs and we've got labradoodles and all of these um, fancy breeds of animals, uh, of dogs, sorry, you get designer dogs. So like a cockapoo or a, um, I don't know, a schnauzer dog. I don't even know if that's an actual dog. You should make one. Cross a miniature schnauzer with a Labrador. Um, a poodle, I don't know. Um, well, in his day, the designer breeds were all pigeons and they made them with like really tall legs or really big crests of feathers or like a really big um, gullety type thing or really fluffy and they looked ridiculous. And he realised that applying this pressure towards, oh, I'm going to breed the fluffiest pigeon that over time you end up with ridiculously fluffy pigeons. Um, and so he realised that this could be the thing and, and he had kind of been talking about it for a while. Alfred Russell, Russell Wallace, what a guy. So Darwin, if I had to go back in time, I would spend my time with Russell Wallace and not with Charles Darwin. Charles Darwin was a bit of a bore. Um, he spent the rest of his life studying barnacles and earthworms. Barnacles are cool and all, um, but Alfred Russell Wallace travelled around the tropics. He would, he was much poorer for a start. It's one of the reasons why we think that Darwin got all the fame instead of um, Alfred Russell Wallace, because Alfred Russell Wallace was from a much um, more working class background. He had to work to make a living, whereas Charles Darwin married into the Wedgwood family, um, as in Wedgwood the Pottery Company. He actually also married his first cousin and that caused a lot of problems. Um, but he married a Wedgwood and so those two families, they were loaded. They were pretty much aristocracy. They, he, did, he had all this time to just, you know, I'm just going to spend my days thinking about pigeons. Whereas Alfred Russell Wallace is like, dude, I need to make some money. I'm going to go out there and earn myself some money by collecting rare plants and rare specimens, shipping them back to Europe, to the UK, where huge demand from collectors to put them in their greenhouses, which were a new invention. Um, and when he was there, that's when he discovered all of these things in Southeast Asia. Um, and there's a thing called um, the Wallace Line, which is because you've got in Southeast Asia, oh, I am, if you thought I was bad at drawing animals, you wait till I start drawing continents. Um, this could go terribly wrong, but let's see, we've got India here. Um, yeah, that is India. We've got what, the bulge of China, you've got Japan somewhere up here, you've got twiddly down bits here, you've got um, Borneo here, you've got Australia. I don't know, what does Australia look like? Um, it's got that and you've got some New Zealandy thing over here and you've got a whole load of little islands. Yes, this is a map of Southeast Asia. Don't judge. Um, oh, and there's another big island over here somewhere, isn't there? Um, 
but there are two different continents here. Um, so we've got the um, Australian continent here and we've got the um, Asian continent there and the Australian continent was kind of going this way and the Asian continent so they kind of squashed into each other here and so because they came from different directions and then joined up it means that you get completely different animals on this side of the line to on where did pink go again on this side of the line so even though maybe these two islands are physically very close to each other um, this one has animals and plants that look like all the ones over here whereas this one has animals and plants that look like the ones all the way over here and so that's kind of how Wallace came up the idea of natural selection and Wallace being such a lovely collaborative um, person and he was like oh I know I got this hero back in the UK, Charles Darwin. I'll send him a letter. And he'll love this. He loves reading about all these biology things. Um, I'll send him a letter and see what he thinks. So Russell Wallace writes down his ideas and sends it to Charles Darwin. Charles Darwin has been putting off writing his book for so many years. He's like, ah, it's fine. I'll get round to it. I can study some more barnacles today. I don't want to write my book. And then receives this letter from Alfred Russell Wallace who is like um and then he's like oh my god this guy has written to me with what i want to write in my book if he tells the world i won't get the glory so i am going to bloody well hurry up writing my book i mean i think at the time both darwin and wallace's letters were presented to the royal society at the same time but darwin then rushed through finishing off his book. I think the title of The Origin of Species initially had the word abstract in it, as in the short summary TLDR version of the whole thing. Because he's like, this is just the first chapter, just you wait till I get round to writing the rest of it. Um, and so he really hurried it up. And that's why many people think that Wallace has just been completely overlooked in all of this because he came up with a lot of the same ideas but Charlie Boy stole all the credit although I will say that Charlie Boy did also go into an awful lot more detail about it and Wallace did some really cool stuff with species which we might cover later on um, <laughs> people are uh, insulting my maps hey it gives you something to laugh about during these times um, so that is the history up to Darwin but that happened, so Darwin's Origin of Species happened in 1859, I know that off the top of my head. I wrote in my PhD thesis that Darwin published in 1959 and on the very first page, that went down well with my examiners. Um, last few people, and I'm gonna mention them briefly, mostly because I just want to point out that the ideas about evolution didn't stop with Darwin. Like, he was not the be-all and end-all of evolution. We also have these people. So, we've got a quick run-through. Um, Shout out if you know who they are. Oh, it's like those pub quizzes. This is the picture round, isn't it? Um, so we've got numbers one, two, three, four, five, and six. This is the pub picture round. Whilst I take a sip of water, you've got um, a, a short moment in time to write in the comments um thank you Jazza for donating but social sciences aren't as science as biology are they let's be honest Jazza is a friend of mine it's an ongoing mock argument that we have um yes finally some women I very much was like oh my god I'm so sick of white dudes by this point I just want some more women um 
And it's a little bit annoying because as we go more and more towards the modern day, um, big discoveries get done by groups and teams rather than by single individuals. So it's a lot harder to point out people. So go one to six, tell me who they are. And then I'll start talking through them and then they'll eventually come up on the chat. James Gurney in the chat, I should point out, is an evolutionary biologist. Um, and so far has got number two wrong. Um, okay, we know that um, one is Mendel. One is indeed Mendel. Someone wanted the pictures a bit bigger. But I don't know how to do that. So let's keep everyone the same size so it doesn't annoy me. Um, so we've got number one in the evolution pub quiz. Um, we have indeed got Gregor Mendel. Gregor Mendel was the monk. Someone asked if Wallace or Darwin was the monk. Gregor Mendel was the monk. And he loved peas. In fact, he, he really loved reproduction in general. But as a monk, the head monk, what do you call the head monk? The monk number one, the prime monk? The head of the monastery said, look, I can't have you studying sexual reproduction as a monk. It just won't do. How about you study it in plants instead? Rather than watching animals, mate, you can watch peas, mate. And so he was kind of the founding father of genetics. Interestingly, oh dear, we're about to have a fun period of time because my camera battery is about to go. So I'm going to um, very briefly switch over um, I need to go into studio mode. This is why you have someone else doing the technical side of things for you. Video capture device, add existing webcam video. Okay. Um. Don't mind me, I'm just prime monk. Um, okay, briefly, this gives you a little bit more time to do this while I reach forward and switch over my camera battery. Because I thought I'd be really fancy and use my DSLR as a, um, webcam but unfortunately I don't have a camera grip so what have we got going on in the comments section we have some people guessing that crick would be in here crick is not on this someone thinks that number five is crick which is interesting because number five is a woman um we've got lots of people guessing number six correctly number three looks like david schwimmer um, number three is not a paleontologist. Um, who else have we got? We all know number four. Yeah, I think you probably do all know number four. Um, so, I've probably really gone and screwed up the... Um, focus as well so we'll see does that work that works um and we're back uh <laughs> this is why you normally want multiple people um okay so You've had your chance. So Gregor Mendel, yeah, we've got the P guy. Um, so yeah, interestingly about Gregor Mendel, uh, 
there we go. Interestingly about Gregor Mendel is that he predates Darwin. So Darwin didn't know about genetics, but when they were looking through Darwin's, um, I was going to say when they were looking through Darwin's drawers, um, they weren't looking through. When they were looking through Darwin's things after he died, they found an opened letter that had been sent to him from Mendel because he was such a big, d important dude at the time that like Alfred Russell Wallace sent him a letter saying, hey, I found these things. Can you chat about it with your mates at the Royal Society? Um, and uh, Gregor Mendel, who was an Austrian pea farmer monk dude, um, who did some incredible, incredible observations um, and kind of discovered genetics and inheritance and all of that and dominance and recessive genes and, and all of that. Um, so he was around at the time, but no one knew about his work until many decades later. Okay, that was number two. This is actually... Oh, Um, this is actually Fisher. Um, I can't remember if it's Robert or Ronald. Um, but Fisher, if you've done any statistics, he came up with Fisher's t-test. Um, but Fisher was like the man when it comes to evolution and genetics. He really formalized all of these hand wavy, wishy washy ideas in as mathematical a way as you could. And he was the one that kind of realized, so we've got like from him, we've got Fisher's fundamental theorem of natural selection. We've got um, Fisher's principle, which is why you've got an equal sex ratio in most animals. And um, you've got Fisher's t test, like he was the dude. Um, uh, number three is indeed uh, William Robert, ha no, William Donald Hamilton. Um, and he is not throwing away his shot. Um, that, did you know that physicists also have a Hamilton, um, but ours is better in biology. Um, so Bill Hamilton, um, so, so sorry, we've got Gregor Mendel who is like genetics. Uh, we've got Fisher who is uh, kind of maths and theory. Um, then we've got uh, Hamilton, who is inclusive fitness. So inclusive fitness is my area of biology and Hamilton um, went to or did lots of his research at Oxford, which is where I went. And he so he was friends with a lot of the people that I was taught by. So he's a very, very important guy in my eyes. Um, inclusive fitness is you know when we were talking about how um, there's a trait that makes you do better? Um, in, in Darwin's time, we say Darwinian fitness is surviving and having more of your own kids. Hamilton realized that actually helping, say, your brother have kids or your sister have kids or maybe helping your mother create more siblings for you might also be beneficial. And that's where we get social evolution, where we get altruism, where we get cooperation, all of that happening. Um, and Richard Dawkins is very closely linked to that. Um, so Fisher, we're talking about 1930. Gregor Mendel was the 1800s sometime. Hamilton was 1974. James will correct me in the chat if I got it wrong. Um, and then Dawkins was... Um, I assume you all know this is Richard Dawkins, um, who before becoming an outrage machine on Twitter was a very, and still is, a very important um, evolutionary biologist. Um, 1976, I think, the selfish gene came out. Um, so in the selfish gene, he was very much popularizing what Hamilton had done and no that can't be that's got to be 64 hasn't it there we go 64 and 76 um i think off the top of my head not looking um and so he no one really yeah 64 there we go um so no one really listened 
to Bill Hamilton. I mean, for God's sake, he came up with all of these ideas when he was a PhD student. It makes you sick the more you read about how smart and incredibly clever he was. Um, but a good 10 years went by and everyone was still ignoring him. Um, and then Richard Dawkins wrote this book, The Selfish Gene, which goes into um, more detail, but also a much more understandable way. Because um, Richard Dawkins, though he comes across as not being very good at communicating on Twitter nowadays, he is a phenomenal science writer. If you have not read The Selfish Gene, you have to read it, regardless of what level of biology you're at. It is so well written, and it's because it was so well written that people suddenly started incorporating inclusive fitness into their ideas of evolution, which just goes to show that good science communication is just as important as good science. Um, number five, I haven't seen many people getting this, but let me just scroll it up a little bit. Um, oops, sorry, Mendel. Um, this is Barbara McClintock. McClintock. Um, she was, I'm gonna guess the 80s, 90s, um, but she was really in, um, in properly looking at genetics. Like she worked out how genes are switched on and off and how um, things, um, chromosomes replicated and um, all of these things for, um, Fisher should be 1918, not 1980. I'd put 30, cause I think that, that, should, that should be a three up there. Um, she, I think she is the corn lady, jumping genes, like she properly nailed down what genetics were and without that we wouldn't have any form of genetic engineering, genetic modification, which you may think is a bad thing, but we will solve, and we do solve a lot of diseases using genetic engineering. The way we create insulin as a drug is through genetic engineering. And the way we create an awful lot of drugs actually is by genetically engineering yeasts and bacteria to make them for us. Um, we can genetically mutate viruses to deliver uh, genes. We're probably gonna cure cystic fibrosis using genetic engineering. Even if you don't like eating genetically modified foods, which is totally scientifically unfounded, they're super safe. Um, genetic modification is a tool. It's like saying, oh, I don't trust anything that's been built with a hammer. It's like, sure, some things built with a hammer are dangerous. A lot of them aren't. Just the fact they were built with a hammer does not make them dangerous. Um, Barbara McClintock really nailed it down. And then finally, we have Jennifer Doudna. And I interviewed her on Skype for a YouTube video, which I think may have been taken down. It was for General Electric, GE. Um, but she is CRISPR, and if she doesn't win a Nobel Prize along with Emmanuel Charpentier, um, who is a French, another female biologist, um, for CRISPR, so that's all. A, that's more about again um, genetic engineering. Um, I briefly want to mention the idea of epigenetics. Um, I couldn't find a single person that would sum up epigenetic, uh, epigenetics. Um, so you know what we were saying about Lamarckism um, and how it's all a load of bull? It, now we think it kind of isn't. <laughs> So epigenetics, I'm only going to touch on it very briefly, one, because I don't know a huge amount of it, and two, because it's not relevant to an awful lot of evolution. Um, it's a big deal, but it's not as big a deal as a lot of people will like to make it out to be, um, which is the case for many things in the media. Um, epigenetics is the um, things that happen in your lifetime, so an experience or something that happens to the individual. So, um, so environmental effects is what we would call that. Um, or external changes, I could say. 
um, manage to modify your genes so can get inherited by future generations. And that's like mind blowing if you've spent time in evolution land. Because we spent all of this time since Lamarck being like, no, if it happens during an individual's lifetime, it doesn't get passed on. That's not how evolution works. Evolution only happens if you, um, if it's already in the genes. But epigenetics means we found out that actually things, it's not just the D, it's not just the DNA, the code, the letters that are important. It's like, it's not what you say, it's how you say it. Epigenetics is literally that argument. Um, what you say is important, but how you say it is also important. And epigenetics is the how you say it bit of um, genetics and DNA. Um, but we won't cover that much. Very finally, um, ah, here we go. So we've done Darwin and natural selection. We've done new ideas since Darwin. And then the final part, because I'm aware I've been on for an hour and a half and I said this was only going to be an hour. Let's be honest, it's probably more likely going to be an hour and a half each week, um, is opposition to evolution. I'm going to mention this very briefly. To be honest, I am only mentioning it because it is required for the UK GCSE syllabus. Um, I will go into much more depth in a later, evidence, a later video on evidence for um, evidence for evolution and there is so much of it you can take away fossil evidence and still have enough you can take away genetic evidence and still have enough evidence for evolution there are so many areas that provide evidence for evolution by natural selection um, that are kind of unrelated like the looking at rocks and looking at DNA are quite unrelated, but they both come to the same conclusion. Um, but you're supposed to know some ideas of opposition to evolution. Um, so very briefly, this is kind of like opposition to evolution at the time. And why did Darwin have such a hard time getting the idea out? Um, Darwin was a religious chap, um, as were most people in the UK at that time. He was very Christian, his wife was Catholic, and although he stopped going to church later on in his life, he did say that he never stopped believing in a God, um, in the Christian God. Um, and surprise, surprise, without wanting to completely stir up the comment section, hopefully, you know, the first hour and a half of pure biology, they won't have watched to this part. But um, religion has been a major obstacle in our understanding of evolution and I think it's impossible to understate how much of an obstacle organized religion and in particular Christianity and Catholicism has been in terms of our understanding of evolution. Um, that's not to say that all religion is bad. It's not to say that all religious people are bad or can't be silent. Like I say, Darwin was religious. Um, but when we were talking about how people believed the earth was fixed, the earth was static, the earth was only 10,000 years old, that all species were created in one week and then remained the same up to nowadays. Um, those were all religious ideas and religion wanted to keep a hold on, um, they wanted to keep a hold on their power. Let's be honest, um, the church in the UK had a huge amount of power over the masses. Um, literally the masses if you're Catholic, hey! Um, <laughs> oh, it's, uh, it's been a long isolation already. Um, but they wanted to hold on to that power. And so anyone that undermined the authority of God and therefore the authority of the church um, would be squashed by this huge organization. It's, it's like pitting one person, one man, against the entirety of the Church of England, for example, or the Pope. Um, so they were very, they tried to suppress it as much as possible. Like I say, the famous debate between um, Huxley, Darwin's bulldog, and um, Archbishop Wilberforce, he was an archbishop, 
he was a religious guy who said that, um, our, oh, what, because this happened in the Oxford Natural History Museum, so I've seen the room, the room where it happened, the room, there's, there's your Hamilton reference for you. Um, I've been in the room when it happened, not when it happened, where it happened. Um, but um, Huxley, no, uh, Archbishop Wilberforce said, because the, the big idea is that, oh, Darwin said that we're monkeys, that we've descended from monkeys, which isn't true. Come on to that in a later episode. Um, but Wilberforce said, so Mr. Huxley, I'm paraphrasing, um, are you descended from an ape on your mother's side or from your father's? And everyone's like, oh, ha, 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 what a great joke, Mr. Wilberforce. And then Mr. Huxley replied something along the lines of, I'd rather be descended from an ape than from an ignorant religious man who um, completely ignores all the evidence. Totally paraphrasing there. And I was like, ooh, burn. Like that's what consisted of drama in the 1800s. Um, the second reason there was opposition to um, the idea of natural selection was that at the time they didn't understand genetics. You, um, Darwin's ideas very much relied on understanding that traits can be passed on from mother to child and father to child, but they didn't know how. They didn't understand that there's this thing, this chemical called DNA that encodes life that gets passed on. Like I say, Mendel's ideas were available at the time, but no one had read them. There were some obscure writings of a monk in Central Europe who spent his life playing with peas. Um, so they'd not really understood genetics at that point. And so at that time, there seemed to be this piece of the puzzle missing. Obviously, now we have that piece of the puzzle. Um, and I quote um, the exam board here when I say that there was insufficient evidence at the time that the theory was published to convince many scientists. I think basically the reason they want you to know about um, opposition to the idea of evolution is because if you understand why there was opposition, you can see why those arguments don't hold water anymore. They, they used to be an argument against evolution then, but they don't work anymore. So it used to be that we didn't know much about the fossil record. We didn't know much about DNA. We certainly didn't have all these incredibly complicated family trees between different species. Um, we didn't have the mathematical theories that are able to use evolution and predict future behaviours. Like when you've got a theory that can then predict things, that's when you know you're onto a winner. Um, what else didn't they have at the time? Um, they didn't have any molecular biology. Um, they didn't understand really about um, kind of sexual selection, which is my big topic, um, which is how males and females compete and how you get things like the peacock's tail um, was the big one. Darwin was like, oh, um, the peacock's tail could be the big flaw that undermines my entire argument. Because he re it's like that argument of there's no such thing as a black swan. It only takes one black swan to disprove that entire argument. And Darwin was really worried by a lot of these elaborate mating displays and traits. Um, but now we know that they're a part of natural selection, a subset of natural selection called sexual selection. Um, and so um, that is the end of this week's course. An hour and a half to cover um, all of these things here, which I think isn't too bad. Um, we now know that evolution, well, you now, know, I knew, maybe you knew as well and you're just here for some company. Um, but evolution means change in a biological sense. It also means change in genes over time in a population. Uh, natural selection is not the same thing as evolution. Evolution has a random aspect and a non-random aspect. And that non-random aspect, the bit that leads to all of these amazing adaptations that we're going to go on to study, um, that is natural selection. The world is not static. People thought that the world was fixed, that the world was new, and that species stayed as they were. But over the course of history, within Europe at least, um, people realised that 
not only did the world change, but that therefore species and animals and plants and all the other living things could change as well. And it's hard to understate how important that shift was from a God has created something and it has always been this way to now everything is up for change. And that opens everything up for huge more ideas. Um, Darwin and Alfred Russell Wallace came up with the idea of natural selection, which is that there is variation um, in a population that some individuals um, do better and those ones will pass on their traits that get inherited by their offspring. Um, new ideas since Darwin, we've got the ideas of genetics. We have social evolution, so evolution of behaviours as well as evolution of physical traits like size or colour. Um, we've got, um, what else have we got in there, um, modern ideas? Um, oh, we've got um, genetic engineering, we've got mathematical modelling of um, evolution really turning it into its own field, its own science. Um, and we've got the opposition to evolution and why in the past there may not have been a lot of evidence for it and religion was actively fighting against it. But nowadays, although in some places in the world religion is still actively fighting against it, um, there is so much overwhelming evidence that we call it um, the theory of natural selection in the sense where theory is the highest possible accolade, the highest level of certainty that a scientist can give something. The, uh, people say, if they say, oh, um, who was it? Oh, Tim Minchin said it, I think, in one of his songs. Um, some people say, oh, it's just a theory. Um, and then you remind them that it's also the theory of gravity. And then they just float away. Um, but yeah, in scientific terms, it's one of the most annoying things where sci the scientific meaning of the word and the lay meaning of the word differ so much. In lay speak, a theory is, oh, it's just an idea. In science, we call that a hypothesis and we reserve theory for something we are certain about, as certain as scientists get. Scientists never say they're certain about anything, that they always hedge their bets. But, um, but yeah, basically it means we're certain about this. Um, thank you so much for joining this live stream. Um, I'm going to very quickly have a look at some of the comments. Um, so thank you so much to the people that have donated um, when in the chat. If you um, would like to support this, I am a freelancer and freelancers during this time, the incident, um, the C word, are struggling um, and I am one of them. So. Um, I've put links to my Patreon and my PayPal in the description, um, which is great because YouTube takes a 30% cut of the um, donations in the stream. So if you want to donate, there's um, links down below, but you don't have to, it's free. Next week, um, I will be talking about how we are all mutants. Uh, we'll be going a little bit more into that random side of evolution. How does that variation happen? How do we get these random traits occurring? Um, these videos will be on my um, on my YouTube channel afterwards, so you can watch them back at any time. You can scroll back to a point in the video um, that you didn't understand. Um, please share them around. Um, obviously, if you've got kids that are going through school or their friends, they might be interested, or just anyone that's so bored of being stuck at home and just wants to do something with their brain for an hour and a half a week. Please um, do let me know. And um, there is, oh, I thought I'd end um, the live stream with a joke. I've just seen one here. Um, the internet says that Charles's wife was Emma Darwin and not Kath Olick. Um, that's great. I thought, um, I saw one on, um, Twitter, which is, and I'll end the stream here, um, when the moon hits your knees and you can't pronounce trees, sicamore. <laughs> Thank you very much for joining in and I will see you next week.